right, it looks like we have a quorum, so we can go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, this is Transportation Committee Chair Deb Barber. It is Monday, March 28, 2022. Before I call the meeting to order, I would like to say a few things about how we will conduct this meeting. I want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is causing us to alter our usual procedures. Due to the ongoing pandemic, Council Chair Zelli has determined that it is not reasonable or prudent to conduct in-person meetings at this time. Accordingly, Met Council members will participate in this meeting by phone or other electronic means, and this Transportation Committee meeting will be conducted under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021. Because we are conducting the meeting electronically, all votes must be taken by roll call. Before we start the meeting, we need to establish whether there is a quorum. With that, Jenna, can you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Here. Cummings. Here. Fredson. Gonzalez. Here. Pacheco. Pacheco, I can see you. Um, yeah, I, I got you. We'll, we'll, yeah, okay, sounds good. Um, Sterner? Here. And Zirin. Thank you. Having a quorum present, we'll call to, the or, call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee for March 20, 2022. Our first order of business is approval of the agenda. We do not need a motion if there are no changes or additions to the agenda. All right, seeing none, we can move on to approval of the minutes. And it's approval of the minutes from the March 14, 2022 Transportation Committee. Did anyone have any changes or additions? Seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Chair Barbara, this is uh, Sterner. I'd make a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you. Moved by Councilmember Sterner. Is there a second? Coming second. Seconded by Cummings. Is there any other discussion? Uh, this is Councilmember Chambliss. I just wanted to say that I really like the new uh, documentation for the minutes. Um, it's really clear and an improvement. Whoever did that, I like it. I will pass that on. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, seeing and hearing no other discussion, uh, Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Fredson? Gonzalez? Aye. Pacheco? Aye. Sterner? Aye. Zirin? And Barber? Aye. With that, the minutes are approved. Our next order of business is employee recognition. I'm going to turn it over to Wes Boistra. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, as a brief introduction before handing this off to Mike McNamara to introduce our operators, I want to say again, safety is our highest priority, and we continually stress this with our bus and train operators who do a tremendous job under very challenging circumstances. Whenever they're operating a light, light rail vehicle, our train operators must always pay close attention surroundings and this is especially true in, in our busy downtown environments and at crossings while they are not technicians our operator operators are also expected to inspect their vehicles before pulling out and to pay attention to vehicle performance whenever they are in service in each of the cases that are being recognized today the operators showed an awareness of their surroundings preventing property damage or worse and i want to commend these operators for the awareness they showed in the situations that will be briefly described in a moment, and as well as well as for their great service that they provide each day. With that, I'll hand it off to Mike McNamara, our manager of rail, rail transportation, who will introduce today's honorees. Well, good Mike. afternoon, everyone. Uh, chair, council members, and thank you, uh, Wes, for the introduction. It's my pleasure today to introduce two of our train operators, Darius Muhammad and William Vakura, uh, who, as the general manager stated, <clears throat> displayed a great awareness and averted injury and property damage, or possibly worse. Darius was operating his train northbound, heading towards downtown Minneapolis and crossing over 26th Avenue and 24th Bed Crossing. Notice there is some abnormal noises and uh, vibrations underneath the train. As he pulled into Franklin Station, he contacted the control center and uh, through the control center, explained what was going on and it was determined that the uh, train should be pulled in. Uh, 
Adaris pulled the train in, offloaded customers, pulled the train in. And after speaking with the shop, it was uh, determined that one of the uh, brush, ground brush assemblies had malfunctioned, it had done a fair amount of damage underneath the train. Um, had it stayed in service, it could potentially have caused a, a fire or at, at least a, a major service disruption. So thank you, Adaris. Very nice job there. The uh, uh, William Vakura was operating his train also northbound coming into downtown Minneapolis when a uh, non-Metro Transit uh, bus uh, unfortunately went through a red light in front of Mr. Vakura's train. Um, he very quickly applied the emergency brakes and avoided what could have been a very serious accident. Uh, again, with property damage or injuries. And so thank you, William. Also, a quick reaction there. Um, William has been uh, see, with Metro Transit since 2017, uh, went full time uh, less than a year, and then came to light rail in 2021. Outside of work, William enjoys traveling, uh, including going back home to Canada. Uh, likes to work with electronics and spending time with friends and family. And he has two French bulldogs, Melvin and Belle, I believe it is? Okay. And one of them just had some kind of a little surgery to keep him on his feet. And so good. Um, and Darius um, also he joined Metro Transit in 2006, moved to light rail in 2013. Uh, his father of four, and very, very much enjoys playing soccer and watching sports. And so thank you both gentlemen for a fine job. Proud to have you here at Metro Transit Light Rail. And I also want to give you each a uh, challenge coin. Uh, these coins were created uh, several years back and has some events that went on here at Light Rail. And so thank you both. Very nice job. Thank you, William. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to both of you, um, Darius and William. Really appreciate it. We know what a hard job being an LRT operator is, and thank you so much for doing your best to keep yourselves and our passengers safe. So very much appreciated, and congratulations. It's a well-deserved honor. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Next, we're on to reports. We have MTS Director uh, Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a few updates for you tonight. Some funding processes continue to move toward key deadlines in mid-April. So one of them is the federal raise grants uh, that are due mid-month. And the council is evaluating and providing a number of letters of support uh, for various applicants for this um, funding opportunity. So council members, if you receive requests, feel free to pass them along to myself and we can uh, assist the applicants with those letters. Uh, next, the TAB regional solicitation is also due April 14th. So uh, that's a process we administer and, and um, this, this work will be uh, continuing through the rest of the year to actually select projects, but uh, we are moving ahead toward the April 14th deadline. Uh, some of you may have seen the story in Saturday's Star Tribune about how the pandemic continues to change regional traffic patterns. and. That story uh, relied on data analysis tools that were developed by MTS staff, and staff continues to monitor and analyze traffic in close cooperation with MnDOT uh, to understand how tra tra changing travel behavior impacts the system. Uh, MTS researchers have also done work with fuel utilization. So we found that although most area drivers use less than a gallon of gas per day, uh, the cost burden falls heaviest on low income and suburban residents where uh, $4 gas can mean 15% or more of, of household income is spent on fuel costs alone. So these findings come from the 2019 Travel Behavior Inventory a Household Survey, uh, which tracks uh, volunteer participants, uh, all modes of travel. So walking, biking, transit, and driving. Uh, TBI participants, the Travel Behavior Inventory uh, record the make and model and year of the vehicles that they're operating, which allowed our researchers to back calculate the amount of fuel used by linking the distance with APA fuel economy uh, statistics. So this is one example of the kind of data that we can uh, analyze and uh, the kinds of findings we can make from uh, the, the scope of work that we do within the travel behavior inventory. So. 
The results of this analysis are posted online. Um, they're on our council website. Uh, I'll put a link in the in the meeting chat for those on the meeting. But um, for those listening online, if you search for Metropolitan Council 2019 fuel usage, uh, that would be uh, that the result for that would pop right up. So I'll I'll link that in a bit. Uh, finally, Madam Chair, on our contracted services. Our service contractors continue to see increased interest from applicants uh, since we increased the starting minimum pay for drivers uh, very early last month. Uh, just reporting on a couple highlights here from three of our providers covering most of our contracts. Of over a thousand drivers needed for our services uh, in these contracts, and we haven't that that need number hasn't really changed. We went from being 189 below our ideal count to 106 below our ideal count. So we're improving our position by 83 drivers uh, since since that uh, since December. Applications have also increased uh, over 70% overall, but uh, significantly more than that for some of our for, for some of our contractors. Uh, and nearly 900 applications received um, as of March. And helping this picture as well has been reduced attrition, uh, which has been cut by about a third since December. So uh, we're very glad for the effect that the increases have had. We're hopeful for continued progress as we're working to continue to close the remaining gap. But you know, maybe most significantly, Madam Chair, the, the operators are appreciative of how this increase acknowledges the critical service they provide to our customers. Uh, so with that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Charles. Are there any questions from council members? Uh, just a quick comment from me then. I'm really happy to hear that about uh, the contracted operators. Um, it's very good news. Um, I'm glad we were able to be very proactive on that front. So um, good to hear. Um, now we can go to uh, uh, General Manager Quister for his report. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to start with the operator service update. With the uh, beginning of the March pick on Saturday, we are about even in terms of having enough operators to cover our scheduled service. But we remain focused on hiring more operators so we can increase service in future quarters. With more businesses returning to on-site work and with fewer pandemic restrictions in place, we are seeing an uptick in inquiries about when we can bring back services on routes that have been reduced or suspended. We are also seeing an uptick in ridership, especially on local routes and the light rail system. System-wide, we are about 50% below pre-COVID ridership with a, with a low of nearly 70% below uh, pre-COVID ridership. System-wide ridership for the month of February 2022 showed a 30% increase over ridership in February of 2021. So, while we can sustain our current service level with the operators we have, we need to grow our operator force by about 165 more operators to reach budgeted levels and to increase frequency and bring back routes that make transit an attractive option for returning riders. Uh, I want to also mention the Women's NCA Final Four being hosted by Target Center. Minneapolis is preparing to, Metro Transit rather, is preparing to support the 2022 women's NCAA Final Four games and related events in downtown Minneapolis between March 28 and April 4. The Final Four games are currently scheduled for Friday, April 1 and Sunday, April 3. There are also events in addition to the semifinal and championship games that will take place during this time. We anticipate that most transit using fans will take light rail. As Metro Transit has done in the past with high profile events, we are collaborating with Meet Minneapolis and the NCAA to support to promote transit as a transportation option for these events. NCAA staff and fans will be able to download a promotion that allows them to purchase rides for $1 to games and events. This is also an effort to reduce automobile use as people go to and from the airport, as well as, as traveling around town during their, their stay here. So we're happy to, to be part of that promotion and we're happy to work with Minneapolis and NCAA uh, to, uh, to provide an incentive to ride transit during these events. With that, Madam Chair, I'll be available for questions. Great, thank you, Wes. Are there any questions or comments from council members? Um, I just have one. So, um, uh, uh, Wes, if you can um, do a thank you to whoever, uh, the team, I guess, that was coordinating uh, transit driver appreciation day 
Uh, we haven't been able to really do that and give it full justice the last couple of years. Um, this year, Wendy, uh, Councilmember Wolf, and I were out at Self Garage serving lunch all day, and it was just wonderful to be back amongst our employees and operators and to spend the day with them and to hear all the stories. And uh, I just really can't thank everybody enough. I think it was an extraordinarily coordinated day, and it was really nice to provide some time to really recognize our operators because without them, we can't do what we do. So. I'll be glad to pass that along and thank thanks to those of you who participated. We, they, I know they really appreciate that and as does uh, as does the, the leadership team as well. So thank you for that. Absolutely, thank you. Um, now we're going to go to our next report. So we have um, our tab report. So we have uh, uh, Mr. DeGans here to provide his uh, summary. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Director Carlson, General Manager Koistra, and Chief of Staff Ken Darris. It's a pleasure to be here, and Jenna, thank you for all your help that you do behind the scenes. I must say, uh, Mr. Kreischer, that the watching the Employee Recognition Awards is a very humbling experience. You have quite, quite a group. Uh, the, oh, and if I may say, uh, hats off to Mr. Harrington, who was quoted in, in that Star Tribune article, which uh, so. <clears throat> The, the tab had only two information items the last uh, uh, meeting, and I will give you a quick 20,000 uh, foot overview on those. The first was mobility hubs. And mobility hubs, as a definition, are a, multimo a multimodal, a location of multimodal opportunities for transit. Uh, they probably, as, as many things have, appeared early on in, in Europe, and they are, they to find them in, in the UK and Germany and Belgium as sustainable transport, dedicated locations, co-located in close proximity to neighborhoods. Uh, a, a familiar example of a mobility hub is the interchange, uh, what to say where we might have a, a bike rack at a railway station or a bus stop. And then, they, and then the original mobility hub was the park and ride uh, that we see across the uh, area. Uh, a next generation is called an electric hubs project. Um, and that is a to increase shared and electric mobility and to, uh, reduce dependence on a private car. Uh, excuse me, again, in, if I may say in, in Europe, they're also coming with a new concept called Mobi hubs and Mobi punt. One is, one is Bel Belgium, uh, is from Belgium, one is from Germany, and they envisioned it as a meeting place for neighbors, a neighborhood store, a locker to deliver packages, or even store a bike helmet uh, while you're using some other type of transportation. The next generation uh, mobility hubs will be freight hubs, taking uh, or picking up uh, on the dro uh, pick up and dro drop off lockers used by Amazon. Uh, the this e hub would utilize. Uh, e-cargo bikes uh, as much as Amazon is, is uh, testing in New York City. And the presentation was done by uh, uh, Meredith Klikota of Metro Transit, and she presented a mobility hub planning and implementation guidebook. And there are a couple of uh, premises that go along with this. One is, how do you configure it? Uh, how do you prioritize the location? Can you, can you implement it? on different scales. What's the scalability? How do you adapt the hubs as neighborhoods and mobility conditions change? What is what would be the equity equity proposition and how and last and very importantly, how do you measure it? Um, one thing that uh, the presenter mentioned is that locally or regionally, we do not have a consistent uh, plan going for consistent framework uh, going forward. And that is what is being uh, what is being suggested. The other um, information matter was the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which again, um, oh, and may I say that the Met Council is definitely a major stakeholder in the mobility hub planning. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, again, over the next five years, 4.8 million to Minnesota, that's a 30% increase. And for those of you who are politically active, particularly in the Met Council, uh, legis legislative authorities needed to spend the federal funds. It, it requires a 20% state match. Uh, 
the attention or the money will be going to bridges, highway safety, that's death and serious injuries, reducing them, carbon reduction, climate resiliency with the reintroduction of the Healthy Street Program and the Reconnecting Communities Program that is meant to address historic inequities. Then, then of course, EV charging infrastructure, mass transit, passenger rail freight, airports, and then uh, for some discretionary spending will be broadband, clean water, the nation's electricity grid, and refunding or continuing to fund the RAISE program, which is rebuilding America infrastructure with sustainability and equity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any questions? Thank you, Peter. Are there any questions from council members? Um, the information on the, um, uh, I would say on the um, uh, mobility planning guide, it's, um, there is a site on our website if you want to go to it. It's not fully released yet, but it will be soon. But the presentation was fantastic. And so um, definitely yeah, something worth to take some time if you've got an opportunity. Uh, well then, thank you, Peter. Um, next, we're going thank to you, go on. Absolutely. Before we proceed with our business, we've got a couple of gentlemen here who would like to address the committee. Uh, we have Ryan Timlin and Ron Camuller from ATU, and so I believe I'm going to turn it over to Ryan first. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, as you, many of you know, um, my name Ryan Timlin, President of ATU 1005. Uh, the reason we come before you guys is. Um, Tonight, um, we saw, you know, we're not here to speak out against specific things, but we want to give a heads up on a number of things. Um, the, the vote is going before us, before you all for the suspension and leg uh, purchases for the LRT. And for us, you know, yes, we need the equipment. We understand that. But what's concerning is several months ago, you all remember, uh, we came before you all to express concerns about outsourcing work to Louisiana. And at that time, um, I don't know currently where, where the overall difference between then where we're at for staffing levels and where we're at now. But at that time, uh, we just needed a handful, about three roughly um, new body shop uh, employees to keep that work. You know, here was the argument being made. Um, and by the way, we've been still inquiring about that contract as far as we've been told. It was told back then that that was an urgent contract to, side, to sign before the end of the year. And to our knowledge, that has still not been signed. And those trains are all still sitting here at that moment, even though we were told this was very urgent several, almost four or five months ago now. Um, the hiring, um, yes, there's been an issue with the testing, uh, but on some levels, Metro Transit and ATU have been able to work out a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, around testing uh, so people can move around through the departments. But one concern we have here is there's still the problem that there's there has not been enough hiring going on for staff to actually drive buses, drive light rails, and operate trains and work on the trains uh, and maintain buses. We have a couple of members that we know are qualified to become mechanics, and there's been a stalemate in trying to move those people over to make sure that they are definitely qualified. Uh, to be mechanics. They meet the qualifications. Uh, we've been asking that they be allowed in to make sure that these are capable employees and our members are willing to work with them to find out. But um, along with the stalling of hiring broader uh, people into the facility, capable people are not being allowed to move up. And we do have contract language that allows them to move up from the other jobs if they are, have meet the qualifications, which they do meet. Um, I know one topic that might come up here, and I know I'm limited on time. I won't keep going. Uh, plus, we have Ron speaking. I'll end shortly here. I just want to make sure you're all aware of that. Um, one topic that management might bring up as well, there's been a contract opener to address hiring issues at Metro Transit as well with wage increases and shortening the operators. Uh, wage progression, but one thing that needs to be pointed out on why that hasn't been resolved yet uh, is because there's being concessions asked by the local uh, in order to get these wage increases. And I just want to give a quick national picture before I move on. Other facilities are opening their contracts, giving four, five, six percent wage increases with no concessions. Uh, I've reached out to the international. I told them the situation. We are the only one they're aware of that is doing a contract opener for uh, 
wage increases along with concessions that would massively affect our membership. Just to give a brief picture, opening up the door for uh, a member to work at Metro Transit with no benefits at all. And one of the arguments being used is staffing levels and single parents unable to uh, apply for jobs here. And the type of proposal that's been put forward, I don't know any single parent that would like to work on weekends, work extremely late at night and not receive benefits. Uh, so there's some problems with these proposals to get more people in here at Metro Transit. And um, I just want to put that on the radar. Uh, we have a number of people here who are capable to move up as well into technician positions, and we are being ignored on some of those discussions right now. I will hand it over to Ron. Thank you. Um, my name is Ron Camuler. I represent the, all the disciplines across LRT maintenance. Uh, I have a lot of information for you. Uh, I've got to paint with a broad brush in the interest of time. So here we go. Um, we're happy to see that management is getting parts for us to do some work. However, I got some questions about uh, why we're picking the suspension leg. In the uh, business item, it says the fleet is approaching 500,000 miles. That's correct. The cars are approaching 500 miles. However, all these legs had a manufacturing defect. And from 2015 to roughly 2017, these have all been changed out. So they don't have 500,000 miles on the suspension legs. Um, I have here the maintenance schedule of the tasks uh, that the manufacturer says when you should do work. Um, as a mechanic, I'm concerned that things like the center brake calipers and the track brakes, uh, real critical safety things have not been addressed, even though the manufacturer says they should be overhauled at 300,000 miles. So if we're at 500,000 miles, um, <clears throat> I kind of question the thought process here. Um, as President Timlin said, even if we get these parts, um, I really wonder who's going to do the work. On the 8th of December of last year, management told you they were down 21 people in LRT maintenance. As it stands today, we're down 28, with a few more headed out the door right now. Um, that's a 33% decrease since they talked to you. They admitted that this was a problem and they were gonna do better. Um, in fact, one body shop mechanic quit. So this work that we're talking about going to Louisiana, we're down one guy of the five that were there at the time. Um, they're going to close overhaul jobs. The, this work, the suspension leg work, is considered overhaul work. The day-to-day -day work is referred to as running repair. Management intends to eliminate those overhaul jobs, move those folks into running repair so we can make the daily repairs. So again, who's going to do this overhaul work? Um, and then we get down to the fact of the matter is you should know, I checked today, there's no job posting even posted for light rail mechanics. So with no posting up, even if a million people wanted to apply, they can't. Um, you know, the, we talk about uh, the test being a sticking point. The signals department also had a test. That test was suspended. They brought three people in, interviewed them, extended offers, they got three no's in return. So what I wish to suggest to you is that perhaps we need to look at the wages that we're paying right now. Um, this is a, these are good jobs, I'm not denying that. We have a pension, we have really good benefits, but if folks can't meet their day-to-day -day expenses, you really can't afford to work here. And in the current job market, um, Metro Transit's wages simply aren't, aren't competitive I heard a speaker earlier refer to they raised their wages and got a huge increase in applicants. I just wish to suggest that we take an idea, uh, a look at that. Um, and in conclusion, I guess I would like to say that I think uh, we need to take a look at how the LRT maintenance is being managed. 
it certainly appears that we're trying to spend our way out of problems rather than manage our resources and manage our way out. Um, I respectfully submit that and I will leave it there. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Timmel and Mr. Camuller. Um, we'll now move on to our committee business. Our first item of business is the consent agenda. Um, we have one item on consent. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the items on consent. So moved by Gonzalez. Zero by Gonzalez. Seconded by Zarin. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Fredson. Gonzalez. Aye. Pacheco. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zarin. Aye. And Barber. Hi. With that, the consent agenda is passed. We're on to non-consent business. The first is 2022-52, which is the purchase of truck suspension leg rebuild kits. And we have Chris Royston here to present. Oh, I can't hear you. Guess it helps if I take myself off a of mute. <laughs> uh, hi, again, I'm Chris Welcome. Royston. Thank you. Uh, Chris Royston, manager of overhaul special projects. I'm here today to request uh, that the council authorize the sole source purchase of motor and center truck suspension leg rebuild kits uh, from Kenora Motor Company uh, for our type 2 S70 LRVs in an amount not to exceed $1.9 million. Uh, the type 2 fleet consists of 59 vehicles uh, that have been in service eight years, currently approaching uh, 500,000 miles. Uh, the each RV is operated with uh, two uh, hydraulic suspension legs in the motor trucks, as well as four uh, hydraulic uh, suspension legs in the center trucks. Uh, we uh, the, the suspension legs are relevant sp specifically when we come into um, platforms. We need uh, the suspension legs to help maintain uh, the platform height so that we don't have any uh, safety related issues, tripping issues um, when people are boarding or unloading. Um, the plan is currently for the, uh, we will be doing the overhaul of the suspension legs, rebuilds of the suspension legs in house. Um, Purchasing them early now will allow us the ability to start a little bit earlier than we anticipate. Um, it was alluded to that uh, the suspension legs have been rebuilt. That is correct. Uh, they were uh, replaced, not rebuilt, excuse me. They were replaced per FMI about 300,000 miles ago. So as we are uh, getting toward another 300,000 miles, we want to be prepared uh, to replace those. Uh, the benefit to uh, doing that work uh, is that uh, it doesn't take a long time to rebuild a suspension leg. Uh, we can uh, rebuild one inside of four to eight hours. We can replace them um, while they're on the vehicle, or we certainly, you know, can replace them as the motor trucks are off of the vehicle uh, before they go to inventory. So we feel that making this purchase now uh, will enable us to get started and be uh, proactive in replacing those. Uh, in addition, those motor trucks, uh, excuse me, those suspension legs are about six month lead time. So yes, we are short personnel today, uh, but we hope to have that resolved by the time the parts get uh, into inventory. Um, having the suspension legs again in stock will help us uh, uh, start the overhaul fourth quarter of this year uh, from a Thrive uh, lens analysis. Uh, replacing the suspension legs will certainly go to a reliable and a affordable uh, transportation for our customers. Uh, the program is fully funded with federal and local funds via uh, project 65703. Uh, at this time, uh, could I answer? I can answer questions. 
Thank you, Chris. Are there questions or comments from council members? All right, um, seeing and hearing none, um, I would entertain a motion for a business item number, um, can't find it on the new one, um, for that the Metropolitan Council authorizes the sole source purchase of motor and center truck suspension leg rebuild kits from Norbrake Company for the Siemens S70 Type 2 light rail vehicles in an amount not to exceed $1.9 million. Is there a motion? Cummings moves approval. Moved by Cummings. Is there a second? Second by Gonzalez. Seconded by Gonzalez. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Jenna, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Bretson. Gonzalez. Aye. Pacheco. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. And Barbara. Aye. With that, the motion passes. Um, that is our only business tonight, and um, I would recommend that that item move um, on the consent agenda to the full council, unless there are objections. Okay. Very good. Then we will move on to our information items for the evening. We have two very meaty information items tonight. The first is our transit onboard survey pilot results, and we have Ashley Asmus and Eric Lind here to present. Hi, I have the, um, this is Ashley Asmus, I have the presentation on my computer. Oh, awesome, Greg, you're going to advance it for me? Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, my name is Ashley, I'm a data scientist at MTS, and I'll be presenting to you along with Eric Lind from Metro Transit, um, results from our 2022 Transit Onboard Survey pilot survey, so this was our pretest for the larger transit survey that will be occurring um, starting this summer. Um, first, I'll talk to you a little bit about what the onboard survey is and give you some background. Um, then we'll dive into the findings from our pilot survey, um, focusing on rider demographics, who's on board right now, and then trip purposes, what kinds of trips are people making. Um, and then finally, we just have one slide um, where we'll discuss the plan for the main survey rolling out this summer. Um, I should say, yeah, it is a meaty presentation and we're going to try very hard to stick to our 30 minute time window. Um, I would uh, welcome anyone to interrupt me with questions. I'll have a natural break after slide seven when I go over just the survey methodology. And that's when I'll be turning it over to Eric Lind to dive uh, a little bit deeper into the results from the survey. Okay, Greg, next one. So starting it off with some background about what the onboard survey is. This is an origin, destination, system-wide survey of who's on transit and where they're going. It's an intercept interview survey, so you can see exactly what that means in the picture over on the right on the slide. That's me surveying people um, as part of the pilot test on the Route 21 bus. Um, so it, we approach people while they're on board buses and trains, and then we interview them using a tablet based interview um, to gather detailed information about who they are and why they're traveling. We conduct the survey every five years. So the last survey was in 2016, and I don't know if you remember anything that's happened in the last five years, but it seemed um, pressing to get this out in the field right now, even though um, things are rapidly changing with COVID. Go ahead, Greg. There's a few purposes for the survey as a whole. Um, we do this to better understand current transit riders and markets. Um, so on the Metro Transit system, as well as, as all of the suburban local providers, um, we use the data to improve transit forecasts and planning and support before and after studies when we implement new, um, new routes and lines. Um, it's a federally required set of data. So the feds look to us for data like this when we're asking for money to fund um, new transit projects. And if our data is out to date, they'll come back to us and tell us as much. Um, so we work closely with um, the FTA to make sure that our survey um, meets or exceeds their expectations for survey data like this. Okay, go ahead, Greg. So that's the purpose of the survey program as a whole. Um, for this pilot survey, we had two purposes. One was to 
sample. Um, one was to just test our survey instrument and make sure that the questions we were asking were going to return reasonable data, um, that the logistics were going to work out, that we had a handle on what firing would be like in this market and stuff like that. Um, and the second purpose was to get sort of a pulse on what current ridership trends were in the pandemic era. And so it's for that second purpose that we chose the 10 um, routes by ridership, the top 10 routes um, that accumulated the most daily ridership. So we've got the green line, the blue line, the BRT, A and C, and eight core local routes in the Metro Transit system. Um, across all these 10 routes, um, we could really effectively sample people on board and get a lot of return for our money for this pilot survey. Um, across these 10 routes, they accumulated to almost two thirds of Metro Transit ridership in fall 2021. So although this is a special subset of routes, um, I think it's a pretty good picture of what's happening on, at least in the Metro Transit um, ridership. Our uh, pilot survey occurred from September 13th to November 15th, and we gathered 400 or sorry, 4,000 questionnaires um, from riders uh, on board. And we weighted this data to um, reflect a representative sample by route, time of day, and direction. In 2016, these same routes, um, it, we had 15,000 questionnaires completed, about half of all the questionnaires completed in 2016. And so it's that 2016 um, 15,000 questionnaires that we're going to be comparing to the 4,000 questionnaires completed in 2021. All right. Next one, Greg. Yeah, that's a meaty one. Oh, yeah. So let's just start with who's on board. And before I turn it over to Eric, I have a couple of overview slides that discuss how we'll be thinking about the data during this presentation. Go ahead, Greg. So first of all, we understand these data as a subset of trips and riders from 2016. So this Venn diagram with the darker blue bubble showing you riders and trips from 2021 we imagine that it overlaps closely, but not entirely, the trips and riders that were happening in 2016. So we're only comparing um, the routes that were sampled in both surveys, 2016 and 2021. Of course, we have the full survey data coming in 2023, but this is kind of how we're, how we're understanding it as a subset of things that were happening in the past. Of course, we know there are some new trips and new people on board, but for the most part, we imagine that they're um, formerly that they were the same types of people and the same types of trips that would have been made in 2016. All right, last one before I turn it over to Eric. Okay, and second, we're thinking about this data um, as a way to look at how we're retaining trips or losing trips um, on the transit system. So across these 10 routes in 2016, um, we had about 157,000 trips per day made across these 10 routes. In 2021, that number is 72,000 trips per day. So we retained about 46% of all trips made um, from 2020 or from 2016 to 2021. And we lost a little more than half, 54%. So that 46% base retention rate, using my air quote fingers here, um, that's our baseline against which you can compare future numbers um, that we'll be presenting on these slides. We retained at least 46% of trips and riders on board the transit system. I'm going to pause there, let Eric correct me if I've said anything wrong before I turn him over to him, um, and also open it up for questions because I know that that was a lot of information. Yeah, any questions from council members so far? All right, back to you guys. Okay, great, Eric, it's all you. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair, Council members, and Ashley, thanks so much for letting me um, join this presentation. Uh, these these data, I'll just say the, the MTS TBI program is extremely valuable for us at Metro Transit for understanding who's on board and what they're doing. Uh, and we've really gotten a lot of use out of these data. And that's why we've been heavily involved in making sure this pilot and then the full survey are going to be um, what we need to understand our system. Uh, next slide, please. So continuing the theme that Ashley was describing, where we think about this in terms of uh, retention, 
Uh, so if you think about that pre-COVID ridership and the COVID era ridership, if you will, uh, what are the differences? Well, the first one we'll look at is uh, when we look at gender. Um, in pre-COVID or 2016, we had a slight bias towards men, more males riding than females, and that uh, got bigger in the COVID era in 2021 last fall. So we retained a higher fraction of trips being made by men and boys than we did of women. Next slide. And what that looks like then is you can see um, that gender difference that existed in 2016 kind of got bigger, where we were up to 57% of the respondents who were taking a trip on board transit said they were male. The other thing to point out here, and we have some further data in the appendix, which you can, you can reference or we can talk about if it's of interest, is we expanded our choice set when we were asking people about gender to be more inclusive of uh, responses we know that people would like to use. Uh, so that did change the, uh, the choice set from the before to after. But the main point is that we have a system where the trips are being made more by men than by women. And then that um, difference has grown. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, it's going to start to get busy here. We're taking that gender difference and we're crossing it with age. So we kind of want to know of that men and women difference that we were just talking about, is it equal across age groups? And we're also looking at the, the um, retention by age group on its own. So in general, there's, there's kind of two stories here that come together. One is that, that um, the men that we retained a higher fraction of tend to be older. Okay, so if you look in that 45 to 54, 55 to 64 range on the right-hand side of this graph, the dark blue, we're seeing 50 to 60 and to over 65, 83% of the trips that were happening in 2016 have been retained for men in those age groups. That's pretty high retention. As compared to uh, women, we have um, somewhat similar retention in the older groups, but less retention in the younger groups. So what we're seeing is uh, the, the system shift a little bit more towards a higher percentage of older men, fewer younger women on board. Okay, next. So in both uh, surveys, we asked, do you consider yourself to have a disability? Um, and we saw um, an increase or a reten an increase in retention Okay, we retained a greater share of the trips by people who did identify as having a disability. 71% uh, of trips, you know, thinking about it uh, a different way, we had 11% of trips being uh, taken by people who identified as a disability in 2016. That share is up to 18% in fall 2021. So, uh, you know, the way to think about this is that the, the people we are serving on Metro Transit in these routes uh, who identify as having a disability are largely still using our service during COVID. Okay, next. And of course, we wanted to look at race, ethnicity. Um, these routes in 2016, if you look at sort of the top of the light color bars, that'll tell you um, kind of the relative share of different race ethnicities. Uh, these routes were a fairly diverse set of people uh, from a uh, race ethnicity standpoint that are riding these routes. But what we saw uh, in comparing to what we saw last fall is that we retained more rides by black African American riders, by Native American riders, by Hispanic Latino riders than we did of white riders. And so um, when we're looking at the overall composition of the um, ridership from a race ethnicity standpoint, it's definitely gotten less white, but it's also not terribly different than it was um, before COVID. Okay, next slide. And this is a better way of looking at that. So when we have um, kind of the, the percentage of trips that are made by people who identified as black, indigenous, and people of color, 2016, it was around 50%. In 2021, it's 55%. And again, that's just saying that we are you know, retaining a greater fraction of those trips. Okay. 
So I think this is one of the last things we'll throw at you, which is looking at uh, income. This is something that we've had, obviously had a lot of speculation about, uh, as, as we have with all of these different demographics, uh, in terms of who is probably still on board transit during COVID. But to document, you know, we, we definitely retained a higher fraction of trips being made by people who had low incomes. The less than $15,000 income at a household level, uh, which does include some students, but is not by any means limited to only students, as well as having, you know, a third to 40% of those, um, let's say below $60,000 in a household level uh, trips. So the other call out here is that we, you know, we retain overall about 40% of the trips from the riders making less than $60,000 a year, and only 24% for those making over $60,000 a year. Um, partially, this will be explained by um, the other well-documented um, information we have about who was able to telework and sort of the income levels of people who are able to telework and therefore don't need to be traveling as much. Um, but nonetheless, it, it shows that there is a difference in terms of who is still on board during COVID. Next. And so finally, just thinking about um, not, uh, not yet looking at trip purpose, but just the characteristics of people making these trips. Are they employed or are they students or both? And so looking at this on the left-hand side, we have um, a comparison between people who said they were employed full-time or part-time. And you can see that in 2021, there's a slight decrease in both categories of employment. On the education side, a higher ed student, which is anything um, college, university, trade school, vocational, um, that declined by a couple percentage points overall. The K through 12 student, largely driven by the high school ridership, actually was about the same. So we know we've been supporting a lot of student travel, especially in this fall 2021 period when uh, colleges are back in session and we were supporting a lot of high school trips as well. So overall, um, you know, we still had about two thirds of riders who were employed at least part time. Calling back to that, um, you know, age by gender graph at the very beginning um, and data, we're not showing you right here, but there are potentially more people who are retired who are also on board the system and maybe not looking for work. Okay. So I think I should stop there and ask if there are any questions before we try to push through and get to the trip purposes part. All right, any questions from council members? Uh, this John, I have a quick question. Um, I was surprised that the Latino numbers or, or Hispanic numbers they had were so low. Was this done in Spanish at all? That's yeah, a great question. I... Go ahead, Ashley, sorry. Yeah, so there are a few ways that we make sure that the survey captures people who have limited English proficiency or who speak other languages other than English at home. Um, one of the ways that we do that is by having um, Spanish speaking surveyors on board um, who walk through the survey like in Spanish or other languages. And actually there was, a, uh, I think, two different surveyors um, out doing this pilot survey who spoke Spanish um, and who were doing the survey in Spanish. Um, we also do some callbacks, so if people don't speak the language of the surveyor, um, they can receive a call back home. Yeah, I'm not sure how many of these surveys were done in Spanish. I'm not sure if the, the surveyor in this round would have recorded that, um, but uh, we do record language most often spoken at home within the survey. Thank you. Uh, additional questions or comments? Councilmember Sterner. Thank you, Chair Barber. Um, the one uh, question I had was, was a public safety a, an issue with uh, ridership going down as well, either due to COVID or, or physical safety and that then with some of the riders, did that come out through the survey? Yeah, we don't ask about um, perceptions of safety within this survey, um, but honestly, as a, as a woman, I think I can read between the lines about the data about gender and think that there's probably something going on with, with perceptions of safety, especially in regards to gender um, and, and women. Thank you. 
And I'll just say we do, Metro Transit also does a customer right. service survey, where that's where you would see some of that um, data captured. Um, all right, before, I do have one comment, but I want to check with my fellow colleagues. Do you have any other questions or comments? Um, well, the other question that I had, and you won't be able to answer based off of the pilot data, but um, also with the gender differences, is I would be really interested to understand um, sort of the impact on the workforce um, uh, post-pandemic, because with the great resignation, there was a significant trend of more women quitting jobs um, at a much higher rate than men um, for a variety of reasons. And so I'd be really curious if that is something that's tying into that as well. So, but like I said, that's a tough question that'll be hard to answer, but I'd be looking forward to something like that with the 2023 um, final results. All right, if there's no other questions or comments, I'll turn it back to you too. Thanks, yeah. And actually, uh, uh, Madam Chair, on that note about employment, we can use um, uh, data from the US Census CPS to look at those numbers over time. Um, the household pulse survey. Um, so we can get you those numbers for sure. Perfect. Thank you. All right. We're going to wrap up and um, try to push through here and just talk a little bit about the, So we've talked about the people who are making the trips, and now we'll talk about the kinds of trips that people are making. And I'll walk through a couple of uh, uh, funny graphics here before I turn it back to Eric. Okay, so here's 157,000 trips in 2016. Um, I hope I've chosen good colors here. So each little icon here represents a thousand trips um, separated by trip purpose. So we had a good share for social recreational purposes. And then in um, every green color, you can see peak nine to five commutes. Those are commutes made to or from work on the peak hour um, and off peak commutes. So those are um, commutes made uh, where the working hours would not be nine to five. So sometimes they happen in the morning or the evening rush hour, um, but generally for working hours outside of that nine to five window. You got trips to and from school, um, errands, shopping, grocery trips, trips to eat out um, or pick up uh, takeout, dining trips, and trips for medical purposes, as well as you've got four little icons here in purple representing 4,000 trips per day for airport passengers in 2016. So if you were just going to look across all the routes at any point in time, this is generally who you would see on board, why they're traveling on board um, these 10 routes. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So this is who we retained just in graphical format. So um, fading into the background are all the trips that we lost. And you can see that we, we captured quite a cross section um, or we retained quite a cross section of trip purposes. So those social trips are still there. The peak nine to five trips are still there. The school commutes are, are still there. Everything is still there. It's just um, not quite as much. And there are differences in retention rate across these different trip categories, which we're gonna show you next. Please. Yes. Okay, great. Eric, you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Ashley, Madam Chair and Council Members. So um, what we saw when we started looking at this uh, in the percent retention way was that we retained a huge percent of trips that were being made for errands and shopping. And this includes grocery, pharmacy, you know, basic life errands uh, that people who used transit to do these types of trips are still using transit to do these types of trips during COVID. And I think that's a significant part of what we have been talking about throughout the pandemic, which is, you know, Metro Transit is serving to support people's, you know, daily life maintenance. That was one of the key things that people were using transit for. Uh, this is a piece of evidence toward that. Um, you know, we did see, um, the, about the same scale of drop off with the work commute, you know, between 35, 37%, a little bit higher retention of the school commutes. Again, we talked about how that came back strongly in the fall of 2021. But really the, um, the, the non-commute um, trip purposes had a higher retention. And it wasn't, that doesn't mean necessarily there are more of those trips happening if you add up the, the total numbers just that we retain more of those trips um, during COVID. So next. And here's what it looks like when you actually break it out by trip purpose. And what you can see is that the big expansion of that, what is that coral color? 24% uh, of the trips made in 2021 were for these types of 
life maintenance, errands, and shopping. Um, this uh, also corresponds with what we've been talking about uh, from looking at the time of day that these trips are happening, which we'll get to in a second. But if you consider um, how these trips are tied to specific patterns, some of them, like a peak nine to five commute tied to a downtown job center or another job center, even the off peak work commute being tied to a place like the Mall of America or another like retail concentration or a restaurant district. Um, things like errands, shopping, social community, these are a lot harder to pin to a specific place and rather they're happening all over and kind of all day. So if you go to the next slide, um, I've shown you this graph before you've seen it and we've talked about it, that the ridership patterns that we've seen um, has have changed from these really sharp peaks in the dark black line to the more gentle rise and fall that you see in kind of those colored lines, gray, blue, and red lines. So what we're seeing in the onboard survey is really strong evidence that what we've been saying about this graph is, is right, which is this is showing us people making trips for all different types of purposes throughout the day, adding up in a weekend-like fashion. And the implications for our service are that we have to be able to support all those types of trips, and it makes it harder to concentrate our service on a single endpoint like a downtown. Because who has been using our service, who is taking trips during COVID is much more um, diffuse, both in space and time. So next slide. Okay, so these, these are combining those two ideas. So we're, we're basically taking all of those trip purposes and stacking them up by hour of the day. Um, so what you can see in 2016 on the left, we have these light green and dark green bars, which are dominant on the top. You know, so going to work in the morning, coming home in the evening, um, the nine to 11 a.m. hour, you see a lot of those non-peak work commutes, those people going to retail jobs, going to, you know, um, second shift manufacturing, whatever it might be. And you can see that essentially those have disappeared from the stack bars on the right, right? We have much fewer work trips happening um, in those peak hours and really all day. But a lot of the basic life maintenance, that errands, shopping, you know, medical, those are still happening. It's just missing that big slice of that, you know, work commute at the top. And so this, this obviously has um, a lot of implications for how we think about um, transit in the region and how we think about um, how we're going to build back to ridership numbers that we saw in 2016 or 2019. And we have to think about what are the trips that are going to be stacked back on here? Are they going to be happening at the same times of day? Are we going to get back to that peak? Um, are we going to be building a different type of ridership? Are we going to be building ridership where the peak hour is really 2 to 5 p.m.? It's more diffuse and it's for all different types of trip purposes. So I'd, I'd suggest this is a really good framework, even though it's very complicated and busy. Um, but if you're able to sit with it um, to understand the challenge in front of us as transit planners to figure out how to stack these bars back up. And what are the trips that are going to be doing that for us? Next. There's the conclusions. <laughs> we, can't, we can't just put the 9 to 5 commutes on here either, right? That's not going to be enough to get us back to where we were. Although it would help, I'm sure. Next slide. Okay, so I'll just summarize some key findings before giving it back to Ashley for a, a preview of the full survey. Um, you know, the core ridership in the pandemic era, if we think about what trips have we retained, uh, riders who are black, indigenous, people of color, older riders, especially men, lower income riders, riders who identify as having a disability, all using the system in stronger than proportional numbers, basically to what we saw in 2016. And again, just to drive this home, you know, we are serving a wide variety of trip purposes right now, all day, all purpose, for basic life maintenance, for medical appointments. Um, we are, of course, still serving people traveling to and from work, but it's no longer the, the dominant 
uh, pattern that we saw before COVID. So next. Ashley. Great. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Go ahead. So, right. What we've presented to you is the results from the pilot survey. So those um, 10 routes, um, the top routes on the Metro Transit system. Our main survey is going to be rolling out starting this summer, 2022. Um, actually, maybe even a little bit before that, when we start sampling our University of Minnesota routes, hoping to wrap some of those up this spring. We are still currently in the planning phase for the non-University of Minnesota routes. Um, so, um, and in general, I'd say we're planning for a lot of uncertainty. We're trying to spread out our sample across the summer and fall because we don't know if it's going to be sort of this linear path return to normal. We don't, um, we just can't plan for that anymore. So we're going to be trying to spread out our sample to buffer for um, whatever happens over the course of the next uh, four or five months. Um, we'll be sampling all routes, all directions um, by time of day, and this year is very special. We'll be including weekend sample, um, so we'll be going out to make sure that we're capturing information about weekend travel. We haven't done this before, and we think this is so important, um, especially from just a transit planning um, perspective. We'll, of course, be reaching out to providers um, like we did with our pilot survey to make sure that operators are aware of our presence. They'll receive bulletins um, and we'll make sure that um, all of you are involved with that. Um, and we'll have the final data back quarter one of 2023. So hopefully this time, 2023, we'll be looking at the final data um, for the entire system. And like we did with our 2016 survey, we'll make sure that the data for all the routes is available to all providers or stakeholders or anyone interested in the form of an online data download tool um, or dashboard, you know, where you can look at these kinds of summaries online. All right, those are our email addresses there if you have any questions. I think we've run up against our time budget, but happy to stick around if there are any we can answer. Oh, you did great with your time budget. So uh, right. yeah, a lot of information. Um, are there questions or comments from council members? All right, I'm not seeing any, but I'll just make a couple quick comments. Um, great data. I really appreciate you guys taking the deep dive and looking at some of this. It's really impressive. I think what's really going to be fascinating, and I'm really glad you did the pilot part now, because you almost within just the window of your survey are going to get kind of a pre and maybe emerging post pandemic look to see what changes. Um, and then I'm also fascinated to see the really changing um, dynamic in the trip types, because I think that, you know, as we're looking at what kinds of, of um, routes to build where, I think it helps certainly support a case for the ABRT system and some of those things where people are riding all day for different reasons. Um, so it's really, I think it will really give us tools to make a decisions by. But um, I'll give one more final uh, check with my council members, see if anyone else had questions or comments. Council Member Chambliss. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I just wanted to um, tie into something that I heard uh, Chair Barber say. And uh, yeah, I think um, just having a pulse on the changes is so important um, and figuring out which of those changes are going to be more permanent. Um, <clears throat> and um, the fact that we've already done advanced planning for service, uh, expanded services through uh, ABRT, uh, I think is excellent. Thank you. Additional questions or comments? All right. Well, thank you, Ashley, Eric. Very, very good presentation. Much appreciated. I know. All right, we're on to our next information item, which is the Metro Transit Strategic Plan Overview. And we have a crew of people presenting, but I'm going to turn it over to General Manager Koyster to kick it off. Thank you, Chair Barber. Uh, our intent today is to really broadly introduce you to Metro Transit Strategic Plan for Transit Operations. And then in future meetings, we will report more specifically on each of the goals and core elements of that strategic plan. In the summer of 2020, we led future planning meetings among senior leaders and managers across the Metro Transit Division. This started with the principle that we do not want to simply return to, to pre-COVID status quo. We know that COVID upended transit, the murder of George Floyd and the civil unrest that followed brought a new level of attention to deeply rooted systemic racism in our region. And our strategic plan is, desi is designed to guide our operational decisions and investments to help us emerge from 
these crises as a stronger and better system. This includes rethinking our approach as to how we provide service and how we measure success. And that was uh, some of the this preliminary data that you saw today is, is one way that informs us on how we might look differently about how we provide service and how we measure success. Certainly access uh, is, is becoming more and more important to people who rely on transit. This plan to emerge as a stronger and better system is really operationalizing Thrive MSP 2040 regional outcomes and principles and is aligned with the Metropolitan Council's overarching strategic plan goals. I think these will be themes that are that should be familiar to you because these are themes that you have been talking about as policymakers. Our operational strategic plan is divided into five goals and four core elements. The goals are the outcomes we are trying to achieve. The core elements cross-cut all the goals and, and our work more generally. Core elements help describe how we do the work, but the core elements are not just about the how we do our work. Core elements also represent values and principles that are embedded in all that we do. Each goal and core element are led by an executive sponsor and supported by specific work plans of the Metro Transit departments. The executive sponsor is responsible for making sure we are making meaningful progress on the commitments we, plan, we make in this plan, and in all cases, the work of the goal and core element transcends the executive sponsor's department. So part of the work includes coordinating across functions to make sure we are integrating and collaborating across our internal silos. Today, you will hear a brief overview of each goal and core element from the executive sponsor leading this work. At the end, Rachel Dunka, uh, the manager for, straight, for strategy and performance at Metro Transit will provide some concluding remarks about how we are tracking progress on our plan and what you can expect to hear in future quarterly updates. And Madam Chair, uh, I will turn it over to Adam Harrington to discuss goal one, and, I, and if it's okay with you, I'll just ask that each executive sponsor pass it on to the next as we go through this presentation. Adam? Thank you, Wes. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Adam Harrington. I'm the Director of Service Development at Metro Transit, and you could advance, I think, two slides. Greg. Uh, so I'm the executive sponsor for We Will Transition from a Pandemic as a Resilient Transit System. Next slide. We've heard a lot about um, how our ridership patterns have changed and the presentation from Eric and Ashley was really fantastic grounding for how we're thinking about what's changed for our customer demand and what the market potential is. So our outcomes, and this is really where we want to be at the end of our work, is that service and schedules meet the customer demand and market potential that we have, that we serve a diverse travel market, and that we have a strong workforce available to provide that service, everything from operations, maintenance to security. So all of these things are really important on how we operationalize our work and think about how we learn uh, what our customer demands are and how we can meet those needs. Next slide. The goal actions. Uh, this is a little bit of a, here are some of the actions. There are many. There's some here and some progress update on that. The first one, again, building on the previous presentation, analysis to monitoring of ridership and travel market to determine growth potential. And I think as Eric said, towards the end, uh, the, the survey data affirms what we had suspected all along with our anecdotal conversations with businesses and our observations of rider patterns, what's happening in our uh, rider market and where we might want to look for expanding those possibilities, things like PRT, which you'll hear about a little bit more in goal three. But we have a lot of work we've done there. We've started the evaluation of our previous service changes over the past couple of years. You've seen our equity evaluation and one of the elements of our evaluation of service is thinking about how we measure performance and how that changes in our new environment. Um, as we think about all of these things, it's going to guide us towards prioritizing service improvements across the region really over the next couple of years, starting as early as this August, but really into 2023. But we can't do it unless we have a good supply of labor resources and talent across the organization. And so that's one of the strategic elements of how we move our goals forward is to have 
a real focus on hiring qualified people to do the job that helps support our customer endeavors. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Leslie Kinderis to talk about goal two. Great. Thank you, Adam, Chair Barber, Council members. Uh, can you hear me? I just, my, okay, good. My screen was spinning, so I'm glad you can hear me. Uh, well, my name is Leslie Kinderis, and I work at Metro Transit as the Chief of Staff. And I am the current executive sponsor of Goal 2. We provide service that is safe, welcoming, and comfortable. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge that I'm the second person to hold this executive sponsor role. Brian Funk was the inaugural executive sponsor for Goal 2 and really pulled together a team to develop and flesh out this goal. So even though I'm presenting today, uh, Brian and others have had a huge hand in developing this work to date. Uh, next slide, please. So just as a bit of background, um, safely getting our riders where they need to go is really at the heart of Metro Transit's mission. And yet there isn't a day that goes by that we don't hear from a customer or a member of our community that they have some really serious concerns about public safety on transit. Um, and so as we embark on this work in goal two, you know, we are really hearing a lot of the same messages from our customers and from the community that you've had presented to you as part of the Citizens League community engagement that was part of the police review back in 2021. Um, namely, that there are many factors that shape one's perception of safety on transit. Uh, those factors can include whether transit stops, centers, vehicles are clean, they can include whether waiting areas are well lighted and well maintained. Um, factors include whether a bus or train shows up when it's scheduled to, or whether a person can ride without being harassed, um, and whether people have to experience others smoking or drinking or engaging in other problematic behaviors while they're on the system. Um, so in total, we're hearing that one's perception of safety is very tightly linked to this notion of comfort or more precisely what leads people to feel uncomfortable on transit. And as a result, as we approach this goal, it really calls on us to develop a holistic approach that's really cross-functional and really involves areas throughout Metro Transit to make a better customer experience for those who ride our system. Um, before I talk a little bit more about the outcomes on the slide, I do want to just make a process point. Uh, goal two is on somewhat of a different path than some of the other goals and core elements. And that's because we were wrapping up our work on the strategic plan uh, just as the council's police work group was getting underway last fall. And so one of the next steps for strategic plan goal two is really going to be to fold in our prior work into the new emerging action plan that was part of the police work group's recommendations that you heard about earlier this month in the Committee of the Whole. So even though we anticipate that the outcomes on this slide are going to be embedded in that upcoming action plan, I did just want to note that, that this will change as that's developed and brought to the Council. Um, you might recall that back in March when we talked about the action plan, we committed to bringing a draft action plan back to the Committee of the Whole in mid-May for further discussion so the Council can see how Metro Transit is developing an approach to advancing the Police Work Group's recommendations. Um, and depending on how that conversation goes in May, we would further seek the Council's approval of that action plan um, as early as June of this year. So that's a long way to say, even though we've made a lot of progress in thinking about how safety is furthered within our strategic plan, this is going to change again. Um, and you're gonna have a hand in that change as we develop that action plan that's emerging from the police work group's work. So with that process point aside, I'll just note that um, right now, goal two is comprised of these five outcomes that you see on the screen. Uh, expand the official presence on vehicles and stations, leverage technology to guide and support police response, support and respond to the review of the Metro Transit Police Department, continue to pursue administrative citation authority for fair non-payment, and center the employee experience in conversations about transit safety. Um, and again, I think these very much tie into much of where the Council's Police Work uh, Group went with their recommendations, and we look forward to figuring out how to really um, develop an action plan that advances that vision and um, builds on this work that we've started. 
Um, finally, I'll just mention, even though uh, we're actively developing that action plan, we're not waiting um, to get work underway. Um, back last July, you might recall, we announced the transit safety initiative to really explain, expand uh, un or official presence on our system. Um, this included the expansion of the community service officer program to get more non-sworn staff on buses, trains, and at facilities. Um, this included increasing the number of people who are staffing the real-time information center to uh, make sure we're monitoring and making good use of the investment of new um, cameras on our light rail vehicles in addition to other real-time cameras we already had in the system. Um, and the July initiative also included increasing the number of police officers um, recognizing that the more we monitor, the more eyes and ears we have on the system, um, the more likely we are to see additional calls for service to our police department. Um, and this work is also being supported in our uh, budget, um, in addition to continuing the investment started back in July of last year. Um, we're engaging in new projects, including um, reinstituting an adopt a stop program, um, and within our capital budget, um, have a project to bring uh, security monitors to buses so people have a sense of um, re being reminded that they're being monitored when they're riding, riding our system. So with that, I think I'm actually turning it back to Adam Harrington for goal three. Thank you, Leslie. We provide service that is reliable and easy to use. You'll see a lot of connection between our goals and our I want to link it back to the first goal, which is we are a resilient transit system. And that really focuses on how we diversify our market and making sure we're providing that access and good service to people. Goal three is really about how we do that. So the next slide can talk, we'll talk about some of those elements. Our, ser our services are simple to navigate, fast and reliable, and accessible for, for all riders of all backgrounds and abilities. Next slide. I want to spend a little bit more time on this one because it really gets to how we achieve those goals. We want our system to look like that. We have a lot of pieces in place. So implement bus lanes and high ridership corridors and continue to use our better bus stops and bus routes programs for improving that service. Our bus stops and stations are the front door to our system and just as Leslie talked about how that environment needs to be safe. Having on-time service is just as important. It helps us be both resilient and reliable when we have service that's on time and we're able to deploy every bus and every vehicle to meet, meet that need. Deliver funded Metro projects and expand the program. At the heart of this, this is really our arterial BRT program as well as the LRT projects. We have a lot of projects in the works right now. We're excited about opening D-Line this December as part of this work. But we also continue to develop the uh, bus stop improvements and facility enhancements to make sure that our service is predictable and accessible. For anyone who rides our service and uses our app, you can see where the bus is on the app and make sure that you have the confidence that you need to know that that bus is going to arrive when we say it will. That's a big part of delivering our service reliably and our customers have come to de depend on it and we want to stay current with the technology that's available. Another important aspect is our fare structures. We're under uh, taking on an evaluation of our fare structures and payment tools right now. We want to make sure our customer information tools are intuitive and available and accurate. So again, getting back to what are the tools our customers actually use. A lot of our customers use the website. A lot of our customers use the mobile app. And a lot of our customers use go-to card type technologies. Another element to this is expanding, enhancing uh, accessible wayfinding and navigational support, uh, really broadening the usability of those tools to a broader array of customers. And all in all, this comes back to how we implement these improvements. Some of the things might even be a little bit less glamorous than we would highlight here. Could be anything from an improved light rail switch or a better charging system in the garage or a new terminal that we add on a bus route that our customers might not notice, but having a restroom at the end of a bus route is a pretty important thing to ensure reliability. So one of the key 
players to help those things happen is our director of facilities and engineering and facilities, Marilyn Porter, and she is going to take the next goal. So I'll hand it off to her. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Madam Chair, Council Members, uh, my name is Marilyn Porter. I'm Director of Engineering and Facilities, and I'm representing goal number four, we make our region more environmentally sustainable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, goal four outcomes, uh, develop a Metro Transit Sustainability Plan, and this includes a zero emission bus ZEB transition plan. Uh, the purpose of the plan is really to acknowledge transit's opportunity and commitment uh, towards reducing our impact on the environment uh, through planning and actions that positively inf impacts our operations. Uh, the second strategy, or excuse me, outcome is developing strategic partnerships that support our sustainability efforts. And that entails um, uh, partnerships with key internal and external stakeholders to accelerate our goals and strategies. Uh, specific strategies or actions include, um, as previously mentioned, uh, developing a Metro Transit Sustainability Plan, and this plan will encompass issues like emissions reductions, goals and targets for facilities and fleet, and conscientious stewardship, um, which through design, construction, and operations. Uh, other strategies include assigning resources and leadership uh, required to develop and execute the sustainability plan, and uh, also participation in FTA Climate Action Challenge, challenge acknowledging our strengths and opportunities. So this is just to name a few, there's, there's many more strategies. Um, with that, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this graphic uh, further exemplifies our two main categories um, or focus areas associated, associated with goal four. Uh, fleet on my left, which is the ZEB transition, transition plan, uh, also the non-revenue fleet, sustainability on my right, um, building op uh, performance optimization, which gets back to the conscientious stewardship, uh, electrical uh, conservation, uh, renewable energy and storage, and climate change. And with that, I'll hand it off to goal number five, uh, workplace. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn, and good afternoon, uh, Chair Barber and Council Members. I'm Robin Kaufman, the Director of Administration for Capital Projects, and also the Executive Sponsor for Goal Number Five, num uh, Number Five, which is we are a great place to work and build a career. Next slide, please. So in fall of 2020, um, we actually created a diverse working group that, re that reflected the staff from across Metro Transit. And we met every three, uh, every three to four weeks uh, for almost half a year. And um, this group was, um, was formed to, to really get feedback from, from staff from all across, the, um, all across Metro Transit. And so we started, uh, We, like I said, we met every three to four weeks and we started by reviewing some of the previously conducted surveys, um, employment sur employee surveys, as well as employee input that the equity and inclusion team had gathered uh, earlier that year. And then we, uh, we met and we pulled out some of the common themes that had to do with the workplace and had a lot of really great discussion that led us to identifying um, some of the key or uh, main desired outcomes, as well as prioritizing activities. So the three really main things, uh, outcomes that we kept coming back to was um, one, that our workplace is positive and inclusive, meaning that it's free from racism, harassment, and retaliation. Um, the second was that we attract, hire, train, and retain a talented and diverse workforce. And number three is that we adapt to changing workplace standards and expectations. Um, this slide here shows um, an abbreviated list. There's actually quite a few other actions, um, just ran out of space on the slide, but uh, these are some of the, um, the main ones. But I really wanted to highlight two instead of going through the whole list, I wanted to highlight two. And um, the first is that um, under the, our workplace is positive and inclusive, you'll notice that um, the bullet number three talks about um, uh, data. Um, and one of the themes we kept hearing uh, as our group met was that we really needed data so that we could really dig into the issues and identify the source, source of the issues and so that we could develop solutions. 
And then the second um, item action I really wanted to highlight was that um, under the attract, hire, train, and retain a diverse workforce, there's a lot of discussion about helping existing staff um, identify and prepare for career paths within Metro Transit, and also to removing barriers for training, uh, to training, uh, especially for frontline staff. Next slide, please. So as far as actions, um, we've actually, um, we've made, uh, just a second here. Um, we have a lot of work that's already uh, un complete or underway uh, by staff all across Metro Transit and the council. And I just want to do a shout out that this has really been a team effort um, that's included uh, human resources, learning and organizational development, OEO, communications, um, the equity and inclusion team, as well as our engineering and facilities staff. Um, as I mentioned on my previous slide, there was a lot, there was a clear consensus that we needed more data so that we could identify issues and develop uh, data-based solutions. And some of the main major work that we've done that's been completed uh, so far this year is that the uh, affirmative action and workforce dashboards, um, uh, HR and OEO have developed these, these great dashboards that are live on our internal website, MetNet, and staff can go out and um, can look at that and look at trends um, by departments and by divisions and by demographics. Um, so there is data available. And um, HR also just published its 2021 report that breaks down um, some training and HR processes, uh, again, by demographics. So we can start looking at who's taking advantage of, um, at, of training and look at some of the demographics there. Um, and we're going to have even more data once the workplace cultural assessment, as well as the employee engagement survey, are complete. The 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 survey work um, and the data gathering are complete, and now staff are busily um, going through and analyzing that data and and pulling out trends and and trying to see what that means. Um, Another task that's been done is uh, where HR has developed a recruitment and selection scorecard, and that will be going into use uh, here sometime this spring. And then as far as other work, um, the uh, equity and inclusion team has set up equity training modules. So as new bus operators and uh, police officers um, are starting, are starting. They have a little um, training module that they're that they're using to train uh, train staff about equity and in the workplace. And we'll, uh, there's been other departments that have expressed interest, and so they will be expanding to those departments. Uh, as far as uh, preparing for the workplace, HR has um, and many others have updated our telework policies and procedures. And a lot of training has been going in um, going on. To, to help Metro Transit staff develop um, um, develop our office plans and uh, transition people back to the office uh, next month. Um, and then um, we're also um, HR um, and LOD are working on finalizing their equity and inclusion training plan for this year, and that'll be rolling out this spring or summer as well. So um, a lot going on and um, Again, just want to do a shout out to all the departments that um, that this that is working on this and um, making making progress. And I am now going to hand it off to one of those partners, Selena Martina, to start with core element number one. Thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair Barber, Council Members, General Manager Koistra. I don't think my camera is. Can you see me? No, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, good. I am not sure why my camera is not capturing me. Thank you. Um, my name is Selena Martina. I am a senior manager of equity and inclusion at Metro Transit. And so far you have heard uh, about our five strategic uh, goals and priorities. Uh, now uh, we will share a little bit more about our core elements. Uh, these elements support our priorities and establish concrete actions and principles on how to achieve our strategic goals. Um, I'm the sponsor of core element one that is uh, meaningful 
uh, meaningfully advance equity inside metro transit and in the region. Uh, so core element one has three main goals. Uh, contribute to regional equity through service, such as performing assessments and evaluations to our service, and investing and expanding our service into the region. Uh, the second outcome is designing programs, initiatives that improve access, utilization, and quality of transit with integrated equity goals. Uh, you, some of these are very well known uh, programs such as uh, the Better Bus Stops, our Transit Assistance Program or TAP, um, our Homeless Action Team or HAT and other programs. Uh, the third goal within this core element is to build and invest in organizational practices critical to equitable processes and outcomes. And uh, this include uh, having, having a robust program that it identifies equity measures and reports on those, such as our equity metric programs. Uh, it includes also investments in staff trainings and capacity building. And it encompasses utilizing best and proven practices of outreach and engagement, as well as in reach or you know, engagement of our own Metro Transit frontline employees. Next, please. So here's a list of some of the actions and work that uh, has uh, started already or, or is underway um, that stems out of the goals that I just mentioned. Uh, this is our second, we're very proud this is our second year conducting a service equity evaluation. You heard Adam uh, speaking a little bit about that uh, process, and we are committed to continue to perform assessments and evaluations that uh, include uh, service metrics uh, and also Title VI equity analysis in the future. Um, we're also very proud of uh, the team that we are building within our, with, uh, within our staff. We have about 20 members in the equity and inclusion staff team uh, that represent many areas within our agency and they work towards advancing equity within the organization. Um, our Better Bus Stops program has been highlighted at the national sphere and is a relevant and great example of equity work utilizing data and monitoring impact. Um, we are also have recently, last month, adopted an internal shared statement defining transit equity and that will guide our work moving forward. In collaboration with HR, uh, we're expanding our equity training, you heard Robin before, uh, to be at the center of onboarding practices and frontline employees. In partnership with strategic initiatives, we again want to further and develop um, our, uh, further develop and enhance our equity metrics program. Uh, by engaging key stakeholders, such as the Council's Equity Advisory Committee and others. Um, and last fall, we launched uh, an internal engagement initiative, and we're continuing that practice of connecting with frontline employees, creating opportunities for staff to provide relevant feedback through forms, written forms, online forms, virtual drop-in sessions, and visiting facilities. Uh, next, you'll hear from Bruce Howard on Core Element 2. Thank you, Selena. And uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Bruce Howard, Director of Marketing and Transit Information and also the executive sponsor of Core Element 2. And Core Element 2, as you see here on the slide, is we effectively communicate and engage with customers, stakeholders, and employees. Next slide. Uh, within Core Element 2, we have four overarching outcomes we want to achieve. And I will say that these outcomes are not entirely new. Uh, but what is new is our high level of commitment to achieving them uh, with this plan. So uh, outcome number one, we want to be more intentional about seeking and using feedback from customers, stakeholders, and employees. In the last few years, Metro Transit has made great strides in our engagement efforts, and this outcome and the associated actions that are built around it are really to build on these efforts. So an example of the actions or projects that would be supporting this outcome, as you see here, is we're going to use ethnic and multicultural media more regularly to engage with diverse communities. And so to that end, we have year-long contracts in place 
with several ethnic media to keep Metro Transit's messages front and center for those audiences. Outcome number two, we're gonna provide better access to responsive, accurate, and timely information. An example here of an action or project that we've undertaken is we're gonna be launching a new web page, metrotransit.org slash performance, where we will make KPIs or our key performance indicators like ridership numbers available ongoing for the public to see. And this actually is gonna launch this Friday. So April 1, you'll see the beginnings of this and we're gonna be adding to this web page as we start to build out those KPIs. And then outcome number three, foster strategic partnerships that support Metro Transit's mission and priorities. As you can imagine, in a large public agency like Metro Transit, we work with many organizations on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, cities, community groups, businesses, chambers of commerce, landowners, sports teams, special events, and the list can go on and on. And this outcome is really an attempt to be more strategic and more coordinated with those partnerships. And so an example of an action or project here is we're going to identify existing partnerships by department and division and evaluate how they align with our mission and our priorities. For example, one of the things we might want to do is to ask a partner how they promote diversity, equity, and inclusion in their organization. And is that something that we want to consider as we partner with them? And then outcome number four, demonstrate our value to the region and enhance our reputation. As I said, these outcomes are not necessarily new, but what is new is our commitment to being more intentional about our focus on telling our story going forward. And so this particular outcome has several actions, but one of those is that we survey residents annually. And from that survey, we get a sense of how residents see Metro Transit services. Are they reliable? Are they safe? Are they easy to use? And based on that survey result, we'll be developing communication and marketing plans to address and to bolster how residents perceive these key attributes of Metro Transit. So in conclusion here with core element two, we've got 60 actions or projects that will be supporting these four outcomes. And with that, I'll hand it over to John Levin. All right, thank you, Bruce. Uh, so good afternoon, Chair Barber and council members. My name is John Levin. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives uh, and the Executive Sponsor of Core Element 3. Uh, we evaluate our performance and foster innovation for continuous improvement. And there are two main, we'll stay on this slide for a second, there are two main parts of this element. Um, how can we use data and performance, uh, performance evaluation to improve and inform the decisions and activities and the resource allocation that we make as we seek to improve our service and the experience of our customers and employees? And how can we create an environment that encourages and facilitates innovative approaches in that work? If we can go to the next slide. Uh, so these uh, goals are, are reflected in, in three main outcomes that we're working towards. Um, and so you can see them here, establishing performance teams, uh, communicating our performance, uh, and fostering a culture of innovation. Uh, so the idea of performance teams is really to focus our conversation around performance management beyond just reporting key performance indicators or KPIs and really look at the details as much as we can of what drives performance and what drives improvement in performance, identify the activities and investments uh, that we can make uh, to improve performance and track our progress on that work. So we're really not just tracking our performance on our goals, we're tracking our, our progress on our, our work to improve our performance. Uh, and this may also mean collecting uh, more data or, or new types of data and developing new metrics uh, of how we measure our performance. And so if we can go to the next slide, we're, we're bringing together teams uh, on the left hand side, you can see them to really focus around seven uh, major areas of our work. Um, and like the strategic plan, each of these performance teams has an executive sponsor who will convene the team, uh, strategize the work to be done, and under core element two, and you can see here the intersection, of course, among all these elements. Uh, but with the core element, core element three, we'll also be working on our internal communication to make sure that our employees understand uh, the performance and, and how their work and how their is linked to ultimately to our performance and, and those metrics. Uh, 
Uh, and then again, the third outcome uh, ideas within the agency. And so innovation really has, has long been core to our organization. Uh, it happens in all quarters. Uh, and so the work of this uh, core element and of this is really to seek a more structured approach in a couple specific areas. Uh, uh, the, the term of the strategic plan, those two areas are technology and shared mobility. And so for technology, we're working on a couple different programs uh, internally uh, to foster collaboration, uh, really to, to keep an eye on what's going on elsewhere within the industry uh, and to make it easier to try new ideas and see if they work for us and creating a, a pro programs that really allow staff to bring new ideas. And the executive sponsor for core element number four and that is we are responsible stewards of a transformative and financially sustainable transit system. So as uh, my peers have gone through, I have uh, three different uh, uh, three different elements that I will go through with the number of actions and outcomes. The first one is we keep, can you back up one slide? Third, thank you. First of all, outcome number two, we keep staff informed of our financial outlook and engaged in the impacts of today's financial decisions. Uh, as finance, with financial stewardship, we work very hard to make informed financial decisions. We look at, we look at priority results, future budget financial efficiency measures, and revised budget targets. We also establish different measures of efficiency that many of you are aware of. We look at, for example, cost per passenger, subsidy per passenger, cost per mile, cost per service hour. On a quarterly basis, we also look at our financial information. We do financial reporting for both senior management and for the council management committee. Our quarterly reporting will consist of various variance analyses, budget impacts, FTE impacts, and service impacts. In addition, we also do what's called a multi-year forecast, which you, many of you have heard the term toolbox. We not only look at the current year, but we look at for the next four years, the next two bienniums out, and we look at trends, we forecast trends, we forecast what the actual state uh, state numbers are for the revenue, whether it's state appropriations or motor vehicle sales tax, forecast inflation, all those types of items. And what we call then is we have what's, what's called items in our toolbox that we then can use to offset any adjustments that we have to make over the next four years, whether it's looking at service, looking at fare adjustments, looking at additional funding requests, whether they're from the state or from the counties. Uh, we also then are going to be providing financial training to our budget directors and managers and all of our project directors. We feel that training is very important to all the budget directors and managers so they really understand the reports that they're looking at. But we also want them to be able to look at the variances or changes that they're seeing and have a mechanism so they can, so they can then notify finance of the changes and have a good idea of what's causing the change. Uh, the other thing is we've had many new staff over the last few years and we really think it's important to start providing them these financial tools. Uh, outcome number two is operating capital decisions that reflect uh, regional transit priorities. Uh, we need to work to make sure that our operating capital decisions reflect all regional priorities. And we also wanna look at all the decisions that look at it over the complete transit family services, whether it's Metro Transit bus, light rail, commuter rail, and look at our, our other family of services, whether it's Metro Mobility, contracted services, and just look at the financial decisions that we are making. Uh, we also then, we also publish our annual operating and capital budgets and list all of our operating initiatives and capital investments. Uh, the other thing we wanna work on is, or we will be working on is summarizing our operating and capital strategies by fixed and variable discretionary outcomes. We wanna break down our budgets between what is fixed, what is variable, so we can gain an understanding of why it's fixed, but on the other side is why it is it variable and what decisions can impact those financial decisions uh, if it's a variable component. And then the final outcome is number three, we identify life cycle costs when making investment decisions and planning for the future. We wanna establish a, dis a discipline where we're actually focusing on operating, capital and life cycle costs, whether it's from an operating standpoint or a capital standpoint, and really understand what the tails are after that initial investment. Uh, we want to look at look at is, is it a one-time expense, ongoing, and then if it has an operating side, does it also then have a capital impact to it, and what is the capital impact? The final thing with capital is we we're going to be working with life cycle costs in the capital projects, and also going to be developing life cycle cost worksheets with our capital programs. 
So we can really lay out what the initial capital investment is, how much ongoing and maintenance are we gonna need, not only this, this, this year, but in future years to maintain the asset in a state of good repair, and then tie that into our asset replacement schedules. So with that, we can go to the next slide. And I will turn it over to Rachel. Hi, Madam Chair, Barbara, Council Members. Uh, my name is Rachel Dunka. I'm the Manager of Strategy and Performance, and I'm just here to kind of wrap up to share that um, one of the from the outset, this uh, strategic plan was intended to be a living, breathing document that changed and responded to our challenges, and also to connect. Um, between the vision of what we want to achieve and our actions to be action oriented. And that was really at the express leadership of General Manager Koistra. And so what I'm here to say is just that, although there are many words to describe our visions and our plans, um, what we're really focused on in this process internally is driving action and driving change. And so in the next each quarter, we're gonna come back with a few of these executive sponsors and they will share some highlights of progress made and change that has occurred um, that is structured under this, um, this uh, the strategic plan. And I think it's just important to note that the strategic plan, it might be five goals and four elements, but there are hundreds of action items that we're tracking with the strategic work plan. And that is just evidence of the growing capacity of our strategic planning process here at Metro Transit that we're proud of, not for the um, paperwork or the living, breathing document, but the the fact that it truly is um, a commitment to action and, and, and improvement and resiliency. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for all of you. That was a great presentation, a lot of information. So um, open it up to council members. Any questions or comments? Council member Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this was just outstanding. This is um, lofty and it's a goals and the action and both a little bit, but I'm wondering if somebody can talk a little bit more about how our goals and um, changes can be communicated to the public, both in encouraging those who were using transit, who perhaps are not in the last couple of years to bring them back, as well as attracting new riders to our system. I think the values that are reflected in these goals is really, really important and uh, can be really instrumental in, in regaining ridership and growing our ridership. And also I think that by being public in this, it also helps to hold us accountable to achieving our goals and so how I know that a lot of this is internal, but I'm wondering if we can talk about what the plans are to also share this with the traveling public. Madam Chair and, and Council Member uh, Cummings, that's a that's a great question. And one of the one of the things we talked explicitly about is to be being more transparent with the public about what we're doing and what we're trying to do and how we're, we're doing in try in trying to do it. You know, they're really we we want to talk about uh, uh, some of the aspirations we have, and, and I think that's part of our mar marketing work. It's part of what we put on our website, uh, and we really want to be honest with the public about what's working and what's not working as we as we go forward with this. So your point's well taken. I don't have a, a script in terms of how exactly it plays out, but it's, it was part, one of the principles that we talked about in putting this together is to be very public facing and very, very, uh, very open to the public, uh, again, with the evaluation of our progress. And others may have something to add to that. I, I welcome uh, others. I think Council Member Cummings has a follow up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Wes. I was just going to say um, it, the, you know, social media is really a wonderful way to reach a lot of people. Not everybody goes to our website on a regular basis to see what's new and different and, and changed and what to look forward to. But um, I really like the posts that come out on social media and it's a great way. It's easy to share with our various networks and so forth. So um, I would encourage that as um, being a really effective way to reach a lot of people too, as various steps are implemented and the information that we want to get out to the public um, that as we move forward. So I'll, I'll just throw that out there too. 
Additional questions, comments? Councilmember Chambliss. Um, thanks for giving us uh, that update. Um, I can see that our strategic plans is kind of like a moving plan. It's a living document. Um, a lot of things overflowing from 22 that will be flowing into uh, 21 and 22 that will be flowing into 23. Um, I have a question about the um, the performance teams um, in terms of like is that, be... is that new or maybe I missed that, but. Can you can you elaborate more in terms of how that is that those teams are going to be adding value? I think this is John. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, Madam Chair and Council Member. So the performance teams are, I would say, a new approach uh, for us internally to what is um, uh, a practice that we've had uh, internally for a long time. Of course, we we have measured key performance indicators. Uh, you know, several, you know, around many, both external kind of ridership, for example, but also measures such as, um, you know, miles between failure for our vehicles or, um, uh, you know, customer uh, satisfaction measures. We, we've, we've measured those internally, we've reported them. Um, what we're doing with the performance teams is really taking a concerted effort to, to uh, ask the question, um, again, which we've, we've worked on that question, how do we improve performance? We just haven't done it in quite as organized a way. So we're, we're bringing a team together with a sponsor to, to look at the, those, our performance, ask the question uh, with that internal team, how can we improve performance? How do we, what else do we need to look at? What else can we be measuring, for example, that help us understand our performance and, and what drives performance? Uh, and then assign and, and de determine uh, the activities we're going to undertake uh, to improve performance, um, assign those, track our progress on those, and really make sure we're making progress again, not only on the the ultimate outcomes, but also making progress because it's, it's sometimes hard. You know, the, the progress that we make, for example, in on-time performance is, is is not all under our control, and it's sometimes it's hard hard fought over time, but the work that we do to improve performance, um, we can track that that work internally. So um, again, the performance teams are, are uh, a new term for us, but they're really reflecting work that we have done uh, as an organization over time, just putting some more structure to it. And Madam Chair, if I could just expound quickly, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's not something different from what John said, but to, to emphasize the point, that uh, we're trying to develop measures that are meaningful, uh, that are very meaningful to the people that we serve and very meaningful to our operations and, and our internal interests as well, and actually make decisions and change decision making based on that. Whereas, whereas you can get caught up into the routine of measurement and it really has no influence on your behavior and your decision making. And we're trying to be much more explicit about that in this, in this process, refreshing the performance measures, making them real, keep them fresh because they too are a dynamic issue. If they're, if they're not measuring what we want them to measure, then we need to change them, not simply say they're not measuring what we want them to measure. They need to keep, they need to have meaning. And we want, and the, and the real way to have meaning is to make decisions based upon what those measurements tell us. Um, Chair, if I might. Go ahead, Councilmember Chambliss. Okay, thank you. Um, it's so refreshing to hear um, that, that we're taking a new approach and um, that suggests continuous improvement. Um, and um, I know that in working with the police work group, there was a lot of feedback from council members to have uh, action plans that really have teeth, have um, meaningful impact, um, that there be transparency and that um, you know, we can um, have an understanding as a council about how we're tracking that data uh, and tracking the performance and the results. Um, I'm just um, coming into the knowledge of what is called SMART -E goals, which is the SMART goals with an I and the E on the end, which includes the inclusion and equity. And uh, that not only helps uh, for the impact for um, all stakeholders, but um, it ensures that um, you know we have a new approach for how we do our goal setting, and hopefully that new approach um, 
transcends throughout the organization. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the 2023 strategic plan will be as well. 2022 General Manager. Madam Chair, I know we're, we're short on time. I just want to just add one other thing to this. I think it's so important that measurement means something. And I think one of the other transitions we're trying to make is that measurement's not a punishing activity. That measurement is something that that evaluates how we're doing, and it's not a, it's not a punishing activity. It's not a shaming activity. It's an activity to tell us how to change, and and we can all gather around that and own that and be excited about that, uh, about information really telling us how 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 to change. So, uh, I want to. I want to bring. I wanted to bring that forward because sometimes you fall into that aspect where it becomes a defensive process measurement, and we don't want it to be a defensive process here. We want it to be an energizing process. Uh, John, go ahead. Um, uh, so today I learned uh, about smarty goals. I, that's great with inclusion and equity. I love it, um, and I was just. That you know, back if you look back at the slide, we don't need to bring it up, but the slide about the performance teams, you saw the seven listed there. Um, but I think there's really a close linkage, uh, council member, to your comments on inclusion and equity with the equity metrics program that Selena described. So that is uh, an area where we are looking at specifically around equity focused metrics across a whole range of activities. And that work then also informs the work of our performance team. So I just want to make that linkage between the performance team's work and then the equity uh, work around the, the equity performance or equity um, metrics program. All right, any additional questions or comments? All right, I have a potential suggestion and a final comment then. Um, one thing that would be good is a lot of the things that you're talking about the programs throughout this entire strategic plan are things that we get as information items. Um, at the transportation committee, it would be good at some point to have um, draw the connection between the goals and the core elements with the presentations that we're getting because that also keeps us as council members tied with the strategic plan and vision. And I think it might be good to keep that thread going even even without in addition to like the quarterly um, reports. So if there's something that we're presenting on like today was like the, the TBI or if it's like the shared mobility strategies, some of those types of things we could help drive that and that will help us stay connected to this this plan as well. Um, and then just a final comment, um, I just want to say I'm extraordinarily impressed. I think that um, this is very ambitious and well thought out. I think that you are looking at trying to approach a lot of the work that we've done for many years, but doing it in a different way. And um, I think that's quite impressive. So thank you to all of the presenters tonight. And I am looking forward to hearing more in the future. So with my final thoughts, I will give one more chance for council members to comment. All right. Well, thank you all. Have a good job. And that is the, our last thing for the evening. So thanks for hanging on a few extra minutes tonight. And with that, we can be adjourned. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you.